Well, hello everyone. My name is Luke Carlson and I am the CEO of Discover Strength. And traditionally for the last 10 years, we've hosted an event called the Resistance Exercise Conference. Uh, for 10 years straight, strength training practitioners have come together in Minneapolis to talk all things strength training. Well, our live conference was scheduled for this past March. Clearly, due to COVID-19, we postponed that to November. And in lieu of the live event in March, we've done a few free uh, virtual events like this. This will be our third virtual event. Now, the events of the last month have made it impossible for us to no longer ignore racial inequality in our country. So as a staff, uh, 50 of, of our Discover Strength staff got together and we talked about, well, what could we do about it? What should we do about it? What's our part? We're based here in Minneapolis and for, uh, to a large extent, we were the epicenter of, of what was going on in the country because the, the murder of George Floyd took place right here. Eventually that conversation led to, well, my goodness, we have racial inequality in our own industry. Maybe we're wise to work within our circle of influence, our circle of control and deal with our industry. And so that's what brings us to this event this afternoon. So we want to talk about racial inequality in our industry. I think our objectives are really twofold. Number one, to start from a place of listening. And number two, when we wrap up today, or by the time that we wrap up, develop some action items for fitness professionals worldwide so that we can actually improve the situation. So we're going to listen, and then we'll talk about what can we do next. I'm gonna kick off by introducing our panelists. I'll give a brief introduction. I'm gonna let them tell their stories in a little bit. And I'll kind of frame up our format and how we'll walk through our material today. I am just thrilled that we have four incredible panelists joining us in this conversation today. Our first panelist is Cedric X. Bryant, PhD. Cedric is the President and Chief Science Officer for the American Council on Exercise, for ACE. He's responsible for driving innovation in the area of behavior change programming, overseeing the development of programs that ACE certified professionals can utilize to help people adopt and sustain healthier lifestyles. Furthermore, he leads ACE exploration of how science-based programs and interventions appropriately integrate into healthcare and public health. Dr. Bryan is also responsible for ensuring the scientific accuracy of ACE Commission studies, publications, and all of the materials that ACE creates. He represents ACE as a national and international presenter, writer, and subject matter expert, and highly sought after media spokesperson. Dr. Bryan earned both his doctorate and his master's degree in exercise physiology and exercise science from Penn State University. Uh, he uh, uh, received uh, from Penn State the uh, Alumni Fellow Award, the school's highest alumni honor that is given to select um, alumni who are considered leaders in their professional fields. Dr. Bryant and his wife Ginger are avid golfers and the proud parents of four physically active young men. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Cedric Bryant. Dr. Brian Williams is a keynote speaker, consultant, and author who is a noted authority on service excellence and leadership effectiveness. His passion is to serve others so they may better serve the world. Over the past several years, Brian has provided training and consulting expertise to hundreds of organizations in over 20 industries ranging from healthcare to luxury hotels. His work with clients has, led, uh, has taken him throughout North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Mexico, and the Caribbean. For the people on this call who are in the fitness industry, Brian's draw to this event, the reason I reached out to him is I first heard Brian speak at the URSA convention in 2015 in Los Angeles. He gave a featured presentation there and was, I, I mean, essentially the best presentation I'd ever seen at URSA. He went on a few months later to be the keynote 
at the Ursa European Congress in the south of France that year. And that's where I really got to know Brian so much better. Prior to his current speaking and consulting, Brian worked with the world-renowned Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company for 10 years. In his last role, he was the Global Corporate Director of Training and Organizational Effectiveness. Before his corporate assignment, he held over 17 roles with the Ritz-Carlton, beginning as a busboy at the Ritz-Carlton St. Thomas. Dr. Williams has earned degrees in business administration, hotel restaurant management, and adult education, and a doctor of management in organizational leadership. Brian lives with his wife and two children in the Washington, D.C. metro area. So a warm virtual welcome to Brian Williams. Adia Callahan is the founder and owner of See Me Wellness, as well as a full-time Pilates and group fitness instructor for a premier fitness club in the Seattle area in the U.S. Wanting to bridge the gap between black women and fitness, See Me Wellness mission is to motivate and empower black women to control your narrative by incorporating fitness into one's life. Adia is a global ambassador for WIFA, the Women in Fitness Association, which supports women's career development within the fitness industry. Join me in welcoming Adia Callahan. And finally, we have Randall Hunt. He is the founder of Athletic Apex, born and raised in inner city streets of Compton, California. Randall has always possessed an affinity for innovation and challenging the limits of what is perceived possible. Randall's company, Athletic Apex, was forged with his DNA and operates with the precepts in which he lives his life. Everything has a purpose, everything has a reason, and everything is done to the apex. Today, Randall is acting CEO of the Athletic Apex Enterprise. While in his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his family and his role as an avid aviator, traveling the globe with his wife, Stevie, and sons Randall Hunt Jr. and Brooks. Randall's company, Athletic Apex, has locations in Texas, Florida, and New York. He is an avid golfer and received a golf scholarship to Pepperdine University in California. So join me in welcoming Randall Hunt. And, and with that, I wanna go over kind of the format for today before I turn it over to our panelists. I think as we broach this issue of race, we need to have a willingness to enter the danger. You know, over the last month, uh, reading everything on social media and interacting with my own peers and my own colleagues, it's, it's my realization that I'm gonna say the wrong things. And I've seen so many people attacked on social media for, hey, you said this, you frankly can't say that. And then I say, okay, well then I won't say that. And then someone says, well, you haven't said anything, it's not okay not to say anything. And I said, well, if our intent this afternoon is to move things forward and to progress this issue, I would like the permission for all of us, uh, me included, me most importantly, to be able to say the wrong thing and to understand that I am not gonna get it right when we address this topic. So I think that's the starting point, is we have the right intent, we have to enter the danger in the conversation. Now, secondly, I don't expect our panelists to speak on behalf of all black people, just like I can't speak on behalf of all white people. I think I've read 10 different articles over the last four weeks entitled something to the effect of white people, this is what we want you to think, written by a single author. And I don't know how that author can speak on behalf of just a massive uh, percentage of, of a population. And so what we're gonna talk about today is gonna be the unique perspectives of our four panelists. All right, so that's how we'll frame it up. I have a few broad questions that we'll lead with. Our panelists will interact with those questions and in fact, pose questions to each other. I will be monitoring the Q&A the whole time. We're not even gonna pay attention to the chat. We're just gonna look at the Q&A or I'm gonna monitor the Q&A. And as you have questions for our panelists, drop them in the Q&A and then I'll feed them to our panelists. So to our four panelists, so we can understand you better, please give us a brief background of you and your career in this industry. And we'll start off with Randall. 
Um, sure. Thanks uh, for having me. Um, like you said earlier, I'm uh, born and raised from Compton, California, straight out of Compton. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Compton in the 80s and, and early 90s when Compton was, was Compton. So it's a lot of gang activity, a lot of drug activity. Um, my father, uh, when I was six years old, he came and he sat on the side of my bed and he said, son, we're black, we're poor, we live in a Only our door is going to be shut for you your entire life. They're going to be chain shut. He said, you can accept that these doors are shut or you can get really good at kicking doors down. And I said, you know what, Dad? I want to, I want to kick doors down. He said, well, champions kick doors down, and champions don't sleep in past 6 o'clock. So that was kind of the precipice of, of how I was raised, and I knew my way out was going to be through sports. And so I got really good at football and basketball. Ironically, I picked up golf, uh, teaching myself how to, how to hit balls in a dirt field. Uh, I didn't, I, we couldn't afford an instructor, we couldn't afford to play on a golf course, but the other sports required other people to participate. And I didn't have kids my age that could keep up with my work ethic. Uh, so uh, from, you know, from six years old all the way on, I was in that dirt field hitting balls, teaching myself how to play and I got really good. I was one of the top juniors in the country. I got a full ride to, to Pepperdine University. They were uh, the national champions. They were the number one team in the country. Um, so during this time, uh, I was the highest paid player in the team. We kind of put it in perspective. In golf, you have, a, four, you have 11 guys. You got four scholarships. I had a full ride, which was a pretty big deal. And I say that to say where I got in a car accident. In that car accident, I lost the use of my right arm. So me being the highest paid player on the number one team in the country and not being able to use my arm was, was a very big deal. And I got shipped around for years to the top specialists, to the top rehab guys, um, I had three different surgeries, and at the end, the doctors came to the conclusion, Randall, you will never be able to use your arm again. And so, like, uh, I taught myself to, to play golf, and I said, well, I'm going to teach myself anatomy. And at this point, I really, I really couldn't tell you, like, this bone right here was a humerus. Um, so I just began studying uh, the body like crazy. I was very fortunate enough to where I had sponsors. Um, I was very good at golf, and, and uh, being black in that respect really helped. Um, and so I had a lot of sponsors. I had Nike and different other people that invested in me to allow me to be able to spin. I've literally spent 14 hours a day studying a, med a medical library trying to figure out the anatomy. It took me four years, but I eventually learned how to reconnect the brain tissue to my arm to get my arm to be able to move again. And I began my career playing as a professional golfer. I had a lot of success playing as a professional golfer. I played all over the world. I won all over the world. And I remember I was in Bogonio, Italy, just north of Milan. Lawn, and I was in the fairway and I had a meeting with myself and it's like I learned a lot of unique intellectual property that isn't out there mainstream. Did, did, did God give me access to this information just for my personal benefit or did he give it to me to be able to help other people? So I said, you know what, I'm going to take a year off playing and I'm going to see if I can help other people with this intellectual property that I learned. And worst case scenario, if it's bad, I'll just go back to playing golf, no harm, no foul. And in my first month, I was just, I, you know, I had no idea if I was going to be able to have success or not. Um, but I, I started fixing and helping people like crazy. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a different amount of money now. I made 16 grand in my first month, which let me know I got a lot of sales. And then from there, I was able to help. I got a contract with the Olympic Training Center, worked with the Dallas Cowboys, worked with the Texas Rangers, worked with the PGA, PGA Tour players, LPGA Tour players. I had, I had tremendous success. And I was able to duplicate myself and teach other people what I do, which is I coined as Bionetics. And then I was like, you know, I, I want to get a bigger boat. I have more trainers. Then I got into the health club industry. So I started building massive 40,000 square foot uh, health clubs. And uh, today I've got, um, you know, trainers that do what we do, which is called Bionetics. We have, um, we have it for, for cosmetic purpose, cosmetic enhancement, like Ronnie Coleman's one of, uh, one of us, has been one of our clients in the past, lots of fitness models. We have a performance division where we help people win gold medals and, and silver medals um, in the Olympics. And then we also have kind of my sweet spot, which is pain, which is being able to correct, uh, to, to correct neuromuscular dysfunction. And so uh, my first club in Orlando, or, or should I say my second club, but my, my first big box in Orlando, uh, in the first eight months we were open, we won Best Health Club in Orlando. Um, we are open in, in Rochester, New York, upstate New York. We're doing really well out there. We're also looking at um, some future uh, expansion plans. So kind of in a nutshell, that's uh, 
that's kind of my beginning and kind of a little bit about me to where, where I got to where I am today. Fantastic. Uh, Randall, great to get to know you better. Let's move from Randall to Adia. Hello. Um, so my name is Adia Callahan. I am originally from Mississippi. And I say that because it sets the tone of uh, why we're here today. I'm very much a, a Southern girl living in the Pacific Northwest, Washington specifically. Um, and it's very similar to Randall's story. I was taught at a very early age that um, you have to do twice as much, right? Twice as much to get half as far. Um, but I grew up in the suburbs. So both of my parents are college educated. Both of my parents had quote unquote good jobs. Um, and so we had a very uh, stable foundation in that. But uh, for all purposes, I am a nerd. I have a mechanical engineering degree uh, from Louisiana Tech. I went to uh, a very good technical school. I was in the band, so I never had, I didn't have that athletic background to get me to here to this point, right, where, where I am now. I uh, worked in the oil rigs. I was a field engineer for, in the oil rigs for a year, and I decided that's not the life for me to live uh, that far away from land working 12 hour days for however many days my tool was in the hole. So then I went to technical sales and I did that for years. But in between technical sales, I started five fitness. And for me, fitness was um, my escape from the stresses of working in corporate America, um, trying to keep, climb the ladder, um, trying to understand the playbook that nobody gave me the playbook to. So trying to read the playbook and understand I didn't have that, that available to me. And so I use fitness um, more for my mental well-being than for my physical. Um, and then 2008 ha happened, which is fine. I uh, decided right then and there that I wanted to make fitness uh, more of a, from the passion to the career. And I did that. So I went back to school. I was able to get um, a lot of education in my anatomy and kinesiology. Um, and then I moved forward with that. I started my own personal training business. But I missed the, the aspect that sales offer. So I went back into sales, technical sales. Um, but in 2018, the call to fitness was there again. And I decided um, that it was time. I got the opportunity to go work into fitness full time. Now, right about now, I will say that I have been living in the Pacific Northwest um, about 12 years to this point. And the reason why it is important to me is because uh, most of my technical sales career has been in the Pacific Northwest. And I became really used to being the only woman, if not the only person of color at most times. Um, when I went to business meetings, when I was at jobs, so I would be the only black person um, in, a, in, my, in my job, in my company and or in the office. Um, so you become very attuned to the fact that you are the only one of yours, whichever yours is, either your gender and or your race. Um, and it was okay, but it, it was still disappointing in the sense of why? why, why am I the only one? 2018 happens, now I'm actually living the dream of mine, which is to be a, 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 begin my career in fitness, and I'm a Pilates instructor, but I'm the only group fitness instructor who is black and female. And uh, a very large, very beautiful um, gym in, in Seattle, greater Seattle, Seattle area. Um, but it's okay because I, we love what we do. I had a client of mine who's uh, very, I mean, she is top level in, in what she does. She, her boss's boss is the, is the president of this top level company, say to me one night that I was hiding at what I was doing at this club. Um, and we talked about it over the period of time. And so that's where CB Wellness started to uh, spin his head from, because CB Wellness is still very much a startup company for me. Um, and she says to me, and which is uh, was something I already knew, but she tells me that black women in America are on the bottom of the total pole when it comes to self-care, self-help, and that we need more encouragement, more empowerment, and frankly, more attention to bring and build that up. Um, and so with her help and along with others, that's where I started to really start to focus in my energies, uh, my skill set, my network, 
into developing a company where uh, specifically and unapologetically black professional women are now the focus point. And so that is me in a nutshell. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Brian, uh, your, your background. Uh -oh. I think you might be mute, uh, muted there. There you go. Thank you so much. First, I want to say I feel so honored and I'm already inspired just by listening to Randall and, and also Adia. So I, I, I can just get off the phone right now because I'm just super inspired by both of your stories. <laughs> I'm, I'm, ser I'm serious. I'm like, really? Like, wow. So my background, um, I grew up on a very small island. I grew up on St. Thomas in the, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So I'm an island boy. I like things hot. And um, it's a very 13 miles long, four miles wide. Luke knows the whole story. Uh, both of my parents, they, they are very encouraging, supportive people. Um, neither of them are college educated or even barely finished high school. So I'm like a first generation American citizen. Um, both of them are from the British Virgin Islands. So in, in, in many ways, I grew up not knowing that I couldn't do something. They never let me think I couldn't do something. In fact, I grew up as a, as a severe, severe stutterer. So I would have a hard time just expressing myself. I'd be laughed at every day, bullied every day in school, hated my life. Now fast forward years later, and then now I get paid to talk. So that's a complete 360, 180 in so many ways. But um, I, so my background is largely in hotel restaurant management. Um, I grew up working in luxury hotels, Grand Palazzo, Ritz-Carlton, Four Seasons, and so on, but mainly Ritz-Carlton hotels. I also did auditing with Forbes and also AAA. So I'm much like Adia said that she's like um, a nerd. I am a service nerd to the highest power. I, I love to see people treated exceptionally well. I, I study that. I've always studied that. I love to see people who are treated like kings and queens, no matter who they are or what their background is or what their socioeconomic or demographics or their age. None of that matters to me. I just love to see people treated well. I also love to see people who work with love and pride and honor for their craft. And that whole thing came to me when I was, when I, was I remember being 15 years old as a bus boy on St. Thomas in this really opulent fine dining French restaurant that most people can go to eat. I mean, it's, it's a place that has no prices on the menus. That's how really high end it was. And I remember polishing the silverware, thinking to myself, wouldn't it be awesome if everyone can come to a place like this to eat? Then I started to think to myself, why does someone need to go to a fancy restaurant or a fancy hotel to be treated with excellence? And that was a seed, to be honest with you. We fast forward years later, went up to several different jobs from housekeeping to wine sommelier to busboy to, you know, bellman and all these jobs. And then eventually I was a global corporate director of training and quality for the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company. So I opened a lot of hotels and restaurants and spas worldwide. And then 14 years ago, I started my company. And what I do, or what my team and I do actually, we help other businesses with their service culture. And I was confident that the majority of my clients would be you know, luxury hotels and restaurants. Um, I was so wrong. I mean, over 75% of my clients have nothing to do with hotels. So talking about nursing homes, hospitals, health clubs, airlines, banks, universities, churches, just everyone has a customer, basically, was what it is. So uh, thank you so much, Luke and Hannah, for inviting me to be on this uh, immaculate panel with these amazing professionals. And I look forward to adding my insight. Brian, we're, we're just thrilled to have you. So thank you so much. And, and lastly, Cedric, go ahead and lead with your story. Sure. And first, Luke, uh, thank you for um, taking the initiative and the leadership to uh, put this together. Really appreciate the opportunity. And, and um, I'm humbled when I listen to uh, the stories of my fellow panelists. And uh, I, too, like Adia, am, uh, I, I, I view myself as, a, as an athletic nerd. Uh, I, I, I love physical movement and activity, but I also understand it's so vitally important. To, uh, to always be a lifelong learner, because I think life's about learning and growing. And I think that's part of the reason why we're having, having this panel. So if I kind of go over my journey, uh, it started in a small town um, back in New Jersey called uh, Teaneck. And the interesting thing about Teaneck is that Teaneck was the first uh, school system to voluntarily integrate its school system. 
uh, back in 1965. I was born in 1960, so so my my school experience was always one of um, being with with uh, all types of folks. Um, and it, um, but however, I I ex I got to experience both sides of life because my parents. Um, were born and raised and grew up in a little small town in Georgia called Hawkinsville, Georgia, which is, I mean, it, it, it's like Mayberry RFD in terms of, terms of size. And it was probably um, in a time warp as well in terms of understanding things that I was experiencing in, in the North, if you will. And we would go there um, for summers because all their family was there. So it was like it was like two worlds because I can re I can remember going and seeing for colored for colored people only type signs when I go down there and I'm living up in Teaneck, which is you know at the time this pretty progressive area you know promoting integration and so forth. So as a very young man, I got to see kind of both sides of that coin and and, and at, at the really polar opposites. And I remember my dad. Um, and, and my dad and my mom, they neither uh, actually finished high school, but they always you know, impressed upon us, you know, it, work hard, learn, 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 very um, pro-education. But, but my dad was, he was just, he had that, that just that um, old school wisdom, I'll call it. And I remember one of the things um, that he said to me was that you're going to meet four types of people in your life. He goes, you're going to meet people who are going to like you for the wrong reasons. You're going to meet people who are going to like you for the right reasons. You're going to meet people who are going to dislike you for the wrong reasons. And you're going to, you're going to meet people who are going to dislike you for the right reasons. And it's only that last group you should be concerned with. And that has stuck with me throughout my life. And it is one of the things that has probably been a coping mechanism for me in, in dealing with, with some of the, I'll call it garbage associated with kind of the topic that we're talking about when we look at people differently because of simply um, the, the hue of their skin and not really understanding who that person is. And then I, I put that in that category of person who is not liking me for the wrong reason. And so as far as my, my career goes, um, I, as you, you've already kind of talked about my educational background, but my career's really been in thirds. The first third is kind of, kind of taking that traditional um, academic route. When you get your, your doctorate, you, you teach and you do research at, at institutions. And so I had the opportunity to work at um, uh, West Point Military Academy, um, Arizona State, and Penn State. And um, then the middle third of my career, I was the senior vice president for research and development for STEM, Stairmaster, the exercise equipment company. And now this uh, final third of my career, I am the president and chief science officer for the American Council on Exercise. And, and you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about our, my role at ACE is that we're really committed to trying to get people to, you know, our our, our um, mission is get more get people moving and that get people moving is more than just about exercise it's getting people to adopt and maintain healthy lifestyle behaviors and one of the things that that we're really committed to is trying to make sure that that mission is achieved for all segments th throughout the entire spectrum because oftentimes when we talk when we look at these interventions and so forth they're oftentimes not accessible and available to those who need them most. And um, you know, on, on a very personal, selfish level, when I look at some of the health issues that beset my immediate family, extended family, and, 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 and greater family of color, I know because of the enormous benefits that if we can get people to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, we can dramatically change and improve their health profiles, that's what gets me excited to get up each day and do what I do is to try to affect that change. Fantastic. Cedric, thank you so much. So now let's transition 
And let's go in reverse order. So Cedric, I'm gonna throw the mm -hmm. first question to you and then we'll go sure. to Brian and Adia and to Randall. Tell us how racism has impacted you personally and specifically your career. And the purpose behind this question is to root us in a posture of listening to your stories. So Cedric, I'll give you the floor. Sure, I would say um, one, one thing that comes to mind and resonates with me is when I was going to interview for my first academic appointment, um, the, the, way, the way it works out is that you, you have your meetings and then you are to give a presentation. You, ha you have your meeting, meeting with the head of the department and then you're to present to the rest of the department because you're going to become part of that team. You present, you know, typically your dissertation work. And so um, before I was about, about to give my presentation, the head of the department said, why don't you go into the faculty lounge area and, you know, get, get yourself some refreshment, relax before presentation. And so as I'm about to enter that faculty lounge, I can hear them, some of the faculty members, chatting about me and the discussion was that he's probably here because of affirmative action just you just can't wait to see what essentially garbage he's going to share with us in terms of the presentation and they didn't know me from adam i mean all they knew is that i was i was a, a young kid who graduated from penn state he was coming to apply for an open position and the conversation also was and, and this is back in the late 80s about how minorities are are uh taking over to the point that whites are going to become a, a minority and so it's like that's what is going through my head as i'm going to present but again my wise dad I'm thinking, okay, these are category four folks, and I'm gonna I'm gonna prove them wrong. And so gave the presentation, went very well. I got offered the position, and and I really had to do some some prayerful soul searching as to um, do you want to go work in that environment with those knuckleheads? <laughs> and um, what spoke to me is that. Yes, you do. Because you don't, you can't let those category four folks rob you of experiencing your life. And you also, by running away, you oftentimes don't have the ability to have an influence. And so went great, great decision. Um, had a had a you know great, great experience there, and it led to other opportunities. So that that's one. And, and I just say another subtle one that I often humors me is that people, because, because I have a doctorate or because I have a title of president or because I live in a certain area, there are a lot of people who assume that I don't experience life as a black person. They, they, they're, they're shocked when, you know, I deal with, the challenges that are oftentimes presented in terms of traveling black. I, I, I do about 100 to 120,000 miles in a typical year. 2020 has not been a typical year on airplanes and in and out of airports and different places. And, and they're, they're always surprised um, if the subject comes up where you know, some, something happens where you get, you get a funky TSA agent. Um, they can't fathom that those things happen. But, but that, that is the reality for us as people of color is that no matter, what your, no matter what your degree, no matter where you live, no matter your station in life, people view you by what they see. Cedric, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for your candor. Um, let's move to you, Brian, next. Uh, again, the question, just tell us how racism has impacted you personally and specifically in your career. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about that. And I grew up on an island who was predominantly black. So all I saw around me were a black governor, black, black doctors, black educators, and so forth. It wasn't until I moved 
from St. Thomas to um, Georgia. That's where we moved before we moved to the DC area. I started, see, I started, I, I didn't see that as much, although Atlanta is much more progressive in terms of having diversity of people in, but I will say much, much, much like Cedric, I travel quite a bit also. I'm always somewhere in the world, not like 2020 has been a bit different. And because I travel so often, I t tend to get upgrades, right, to first class, oftentimes. And I'm usually the only black person in first class. Not only that, I'm usually the only younger black person. Now I'm 43 years old, but I started living that kind of life when I was in like 27, when I got a corporate job and I was traveling all the time. And I, would, I, mean, I could almost, it got to a point where I disliked getting the upgrades because whoever was next to me would generally ask me, so what do you do? Like, are you an athlete or something? Are you, um, are you, like, um, are you a, a celebrity? And I'm getting these questions and they're not asking anybody else those questions, <laughs> you see? And it like, look, you know me, I am the most optimistic person on earth. My wife calls me naive. But in, <laughs> in my case, I have to strain myself to attribute race as a reason for somebody to be in the category four, like what Cedric's father said. Like, that's like the last thing I think about. I don't assume if someone, uh, mistreats me, whatever that is race. It could be, I, I'm more likely to think, well, you know, that's an idiot, or that person is unprofessional, or that person, that's, that's usually one of the last things. So I remember uh, my, so my mom, she has a boutique, a clothing boutique, a small, small shop on St. Thomas. And I remember being with her one time, and we were like, at a convention looking for like vendors, right, so she could order clothes from. And she was walking by, she was walking by, and then she saw something that caught her eye, so she was going into a vendor. And the vendor said, I'm so sorry, but this is only for people who want to buy clothes. Mm. So, and my mom, she started to walk up, but then she stopped. And she just got this resoluteness like a black mom, like, what the what? And she like turned around and went back in there and said, excuse me but I own a store and I came here to spend thousands of dollars to buy, to look for merchandise. And the person was like, oh, I'm like, you know, like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And, I'm, and that's the first time it really hit me, like how people can just um, misjudge you or think less of you or assume that you don't have purely because of your skin color. Hmm. Purely because of your skin color. So I would say just lastly, lastly, I would say, not overt racism, but just the systemic racism that we're talking about. I, it, I never realized that starting from scratch was like the norm. Well, that was not the norm. Like for me, I had to start from scratch. I had nothing. Like parents didn't give me any money for college. I didn't even know that was a thing until I moved to the States. I didn't know parents gave kids money for college. And so everything, that was like, what? That <laughs> happens? And like, you know, parents give my kids money to buy down payment for a house. And so everything that my wife and I, we've been blessed by the grace of God, we've been blessed to build, is, has been completely from scratch. And that's more, I would say, that was, that's, that's more from like a generational systemic racism, whereby my white counterparts, they may have had an advantage. They may have had parents or parents' parents who owned property or who went to college or something along those lines. But at the end of the day, the biggest thing I was learned as it relates to systemic racism, although that word was like never used in our house, was never ever blame someone else for something that I couldn't do. If mm -hmm. I want to do some, you go do it. Like failure will never overtake me if my determination to succeed is strong enough. And that's where, and that's my stance on everything. If I really want to accomplish something, nobody with God's help will stop me from doing it. So. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Adia, you have the floor. Um, so I've cut my teeth um, career-wise in the 2000 to present. So I don't have the story, um, and thankfully I don't have the story of overt racism within my career directly, because now that's considered illegal, right? Um, to be able to say to someone's face or make comments um, based off their race or gender or sexuality. Um, my story has always been more of the, um, to Brian's point, uh, the 
overt, the undertone, the tonage about things. Um, as I've said, I've worked until recently, I mainly worked in more of a, a technical type of background, technical type of field. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't uncommon for sometimes a manager say, you know, you're you're really articulate. <laughs> right? You're you're very articulate. And you're pretty smart. And that's it. To say those things, um, to discount the fact that I have a college, I'm college educated. I better be articulate. I had to pass classes. I had to get a job. I had to b represent my company. Um, to say those things as if it's a compliment, right? Or the fact that I have, because I, I'm from the South, so I understand, even as a woman, what it's like to be pulled over uh, by the police. There's no taillight issue. My tags are all up to date. I'm not speeding because you can't, you can't, I don't have a ticket. So why are you pulling me over? Is it, oh, because the, the neighborhood? Well, I live here. So um, it, it, there has been a lot of things. I, I actually have had within the last 10 years, someone in, a, in my workplace asked to touch my hair. And you think, yeah, you think that in, within now, we all understand that there's a bubble, but there's common decency that goes along with it. And I'm not, I'm not a unique being in the fact that I'm not made up of something different overly more so that, I mean, all of us people, we're like more than 90% the same genetically. What makes us different is such a small percentage that it should not be something that is, can I touch your hair from one adult to another? Or yes, my parents are still married they, at the time they were. I have my dad's last name because I know who my dad is. That's a conversation I've, I've had within the workplace. Um, so it's been those kind of conversations and those kind of comments um, that they bite at you and you have to make a decision. Do you stay to uh, Cedric's point? Do you stay? Do you go? Um, but even more importantly, what is your recourse, right? What is your recourse mm -hmm. as the employee? Can, can you say something to someone? Can, um, is there a cultural thing? There's a lot of other conversation that happens internally and that, you want to have, but again, if you're the only or one of the few, it's hard to have one of those kind of conversations. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're having this panel, this round table, is because then when things do happen, there's more implications just than just to the person. It's what happens to not only a community, but what happens to the profession also. Um, so again, I'm lucky in the fact that I don't know what it's like to have direct racism, although I'm from the South, so I still, I'm, I'm an 80s baby, so I still remember Ku Klux Klan rallies, and I'm only one generation removed from Jim Crow, because my parents, uh, who are a little older than Cedric, they were actually desegregated, so they really remember what it is like, so they're, that kind of, that kind of community and then that kind of experience has translated into us because we're still close enough to feel it. But um, it's definitely more of the undertones that goes along with it. And that has been my experience. Adia, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, the same question to you now, Randall, how has racism impacted you personally and professionally? Um, I'd say uh, for me, racism, racism has shaped my life. Uh, I, I have had a lot of direct racism growing up in Compton. I mean, I've been roughed up by the police, put on police cars, on the hood of police cars. Uh, if you guys, I, I grew up playing golf um, before golf was racially acceptable, before Tiger Woods. So me as a 12-year-old kid going to some tournaments, I've had people literally spit in my face and call me a nigger and tell me I shouldn't be there. I've had, um, I've gotten tussles with skinheads over the color of my skin. I've, I've kind of had some, some bumpy rides in, in terms of direct uh, just blatant racism. I got a scholarship to go to a private school in high school. In my first week, I had a guy walk up to me, spit in my face, call me a nigger, tell me to carry his books. You know, so like I, I had that, but um, I was blessed to have a good father who was able to prepare me for that journey of, of racism and being black. And, and uh, um, idea like what you were saying, what about how your parents were saying, you have to be twice as good to get half as far. You know, my, my dad was the same way. You got to be 10 times as good for the same shot. So I went into life with that mentality 
um, which which was fine by me. It was the, when I when those things happened, I remember I remember crying. Um, you know, after the guy, so I was a twelve year old kid, spit in my face, and and you know, I remember crying to my dad, and my dad sitting me down and just being like, "It's okay, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna keep us from getting our goals." And my dad, you guys, if anyone has a has a shit on the planet, should be a uh, uh, have a racist chip on his shoulder. It should be my dad. My dad grew up in San Antonio, Texas. He was the youngest of nine kids. His older brother raised him, and my dad, he was I think eight or nine at the time, watched a hate crime. Racists came up in a truck, and they jumped out of the truck and beat my dad's older brother to death in front of him. So he experienced firsthand extreme racism. My dad was doing the Jim, Jim Crow laws. Part of the reason he pushed me to golf is because he could in the 50s when he was growing up and wanted to play golf. Uh, but my dad had a mentality of like, in, uh, even in school, my sister and I, like we had to read uh, Malcolm X is one of the books we had to read in school. My dad would not allow us to read that book. Um, and the reason being is he was like, this is a white world that we live in. And if you go through life with a chip on your shoulder against white people, you're never going to advance. And so for me, when I've hit obstacles, I mean, I get, I, for whatever reason, I, I mean, maybe racism comes to me, you know, in, in terms like, for instance, I'll give you. I had racism happen to me this last weekend. You know, when I was driving back from Houston, going through Louisiana, I got pulled over by the cops and the cop had made me get out, get out the car. You know, it's going five miles over the, the speed limit in the last zone I remember going in. And he told me to sit on the ground. You know, I got my wife and kids in the car, I refused to sit on the ground. Uh, he didn't press it, but in front of me, he called for backup. It was like, hey, we have a stolen car. All of these assumptions and my car was not stolen, obviously, I'm here. You know, but all of these things are happening blatantly in front of me and they're talking blatantly in front of me. But for me, it's like, when you're the best at what you do, it doesn't matter what color you are. You know, and I, I got so much respect for Brian and I like for Brian, for you to move up where you moved up at the Ritz Carlton, like I know how good you are at what you do because they're looking for reasons to not have you there. Like it's difficult having change. And I just say that, you know, like Ritz Carlton, I have nothing against the Ritz Carlton, but I just know being a person of color in this world, you have to be the, you have to be the best at what you do. When you're the best, you know, if you're going into life expecting, you know, like, um, like Adia was saying at the end, I mean, I'm sorry, Adia, am I saying your name right? I don't want to butcher your name. Okay, it's sorry. Adia. Yeah, okay, it's okay, Adia. Okay, Adia. Yep. My bad. Sorry about that. So Adia was, you know, was saying, you know, if you go with the expectation of, of not being a victim, if you ever look at yourself as a victim, you lost. You have to be a victor. And so for racism at a, at a very early age, I expected to go into life with it not being fair. I expected a lot. I, I walked into life with, with knowing that the cards are going to be stacked against me always, but also remembering it's okay that the cards are stacked against me. I'm still going to succeed. Um, to give you an, an example of it in business, like, you know, for me, um, so I've, I've never worked for anyone. So I've, I've, uh, I play professional golf. I started off as a personal trainer, just being a personal trainer. Then I developed a personal training business. Then I built health clubs. I employ hundreds of people. So for me, there's no one that's ever stepped in front of me in terms of like in my, in my business, but people have definitely tried to stop the advancement of my business. And, and, and for me in the service business and, and all of you, Cedric, Adia, Brian, you've had people that you've got in front of that they walk in, they see who you are, and then they walk out, right? So for me, when I was my very early personal training, I was kind of known as the fix-it guy. And I had a very high-end demographic, very high-end clientele. To put it in perspective, I was charging between three to 500 bucks an hour. And people would come in and they'd be, oh, it's the fix-it guy, it's Randall Hunt, I'm gonna go see him. And these are like just like straight racism people, like, hey, I'm sorry, but you know, this is, I don't want you touching me, I don't want to be in a, like straight told me that. And then ironically, their back kept hurting, whatever the symptom was, they ended up coming back to me because I was, I was just that good at what I did. And I'm not saying that to brag, or I'm not saying that to, um, to be you know, stupid, but I'm just saying like, for me, I've used racism. I know it's gonna happen in my life. I know it's going to continue to happen in my life. And the way that I'm raising my sons is that it's okay, I'll say it's okay that it happens. Like, you know, let's peacefully protest. Let's peacefully get our word out about change. But America's great. You know, America, for a black man to have an opportunity for me to go from the gutter to where me and my family are today, I am truly grateful for America. And I'm truly grateful for um, the opportunities that we have, though, though it is bumpy and though it is different. And I have a lot of white friends that I care tremendously about. And look, if I'm going too long, just signal, wave your hand or whatever. But I'll continue. I, 
I've, I've got a lot of white friends that, you know, have been, their eyes have been open just living life with me. Uh, to give you an example, I lived, um, live in a very nice uh, housing community and I'm riding my bikes with one of my best friends and we're both riding bikes. And if you guys could picture a, ch a chocolate Lance Armstrong, like I was a chocolate Lance Armstrong on this bike with the matching bike and the matching cleats and the matching hat and super advanced bike. And I'm pulling my son behind me, a little two wheeler car. And I've got a big orange flag swing, right? And so we're driving around the community with one of my, one of my buddies. He's in a hot yellow suit. We think we're hot to trot. And the sheriff pulls us over and comes up to me and is like, what are you doing in this neighborhood? You know, and so I kind of show my ID, show him that I live in the neighborhood. And uh, I'm just kind of like, in my head, I'm like, if I was going to be robbing this neighborhood, I probably wouldn't have a world in the back. And I probably wouldn't have a big orange flag for everyone to see me. But for me, I gave my ID, he checked me out, let me go. And my friend that I was with was just so appalled. And he actually called and complained to the sheriff's office. And he was just like, I couldn't, I cannot believe he had no right to do that. But just being black, I was like, it really didn't rattle me that much. It's like, you know, it wasn't my first run in with this. It's like, um, for me, racism is giving me a, a, a thicker skin that has helped me, I guess you could say, advance professionally. Um, even though uh, it's not good, it's not right. It's just, it's just what is. Um, and and kind of what Brian was saying, you know, it's like at the end, you know, if you're phenomenal at what you do, if you're 10 times as good, that's how you overcome it. Randall, thank you. That was fantastic. And, and you made a few comments there that I'd like to circle back to later in our discussion. Um, and I'd actually like to pose this next question to you, Randall, and then we'll go again in reverse order. So Randall and Adia and Brian and Cedric, um, describe in your words, the current climate um, related to unconscious bias and racism in the fitness industry. So give us your state of the industry on this topic. Uh, on the topics of Black Lives Matter or the movement or on topic of just race in, in general? I would say racism in the fitness industry. What do you think we're looking at right now? Um, I think that, uh, like um, Adia was saying, that she is the only person of, of color in her building. I think that's kind of the norm in the fitness industry. Um, and for me as a business owner, I make sure, like, I think a lot of business owners are missing a lot of meat on the table, not catering to minorities, not marketing to minorities. So what you have is you have, a, if you, I mean, if you look at the stats, you look at Ursa stats, who we're selling to in this industry, we're selling to a predominantly white market. So you obviously want to be able to, to capture that. But in term, and normally most businesses are going to hire to cater to the white market. They're going to hire white people. Um, so my health club in Orlando, like I said, was out of like, I think a couple thousand health clubs was number one in Orlando. And a big reason why that is, is because I created diversity. I created diversity at the front desk. I have Asians, people, Asian people that work for me. I have black people that work for me. I have Hispanic people that work for me and group instructors. And what you saw was if you're, you're going to get the white de demographic anyway, they're going to be coming in because that's, that's part of their, their wheelhouse, part of their, their culture already. But when you start getting the black hits, you start getting the minority hits, they walk in, I feel comfortable. I walk in, hey, you know, this, she's, I, I have a lady in my in Orlando club that does um, a Jamaican Zumba, and they're part of culture and flavors, and people come for all that. From a business standpoint, you're able to get a lot more meat on the bone. But just kind of like Adia was saying, just what Brian was saying, and what Cedric has been saying, is when you walk into any corporate situation that's predominantly white, it's not comfortable to hire outside of the norm. It, it's not comfortable. I don't know you as well. I don't have as much experience with you as much. I'm not gonna tell you that, but that's just the reality of what it is. And so I'm kind of speaking to just business owners out there listening now. It's like by getting some ideas on your, uh, um, on your team, getting Brian's, getting Randall's on your team that to work for you, your business is gonna grow exponentially because you're being more diverse. And what I say that is that I think all the panelists will agree with me when I say this, but when we walk into a room, and let's just say we're at dinner, and it's an all white room, and you see one other black person there, you're gonna make eye contact with that person. Am I right? And they're probably gonna give like a, you know, like, hey, I see you, right? You probably never go up to that person, never speak to that person, but like, I mean, how, how true is that panelist to what I'm saying? Right, so it's a it's a hundred percent on, but you the same very true, very true. For the for the business owners out there, you want your clients 
mean, you want your demographic, your customers, like we're not going to walk in as a minority and, and say, hey, I'm not going to sign up because I don't feel comfortable. We're going to walk in and see someone behind the, the front desk with, of color and be like, okay, I can get with this place. You know, they're diverse. Like it speaks volumes, even if you just have it sprinkled in. Granted, like for me, I had an issue when I was hiring for my club in Orlando. My, my wife is white, right? But she gets the whole racial dynamic. And she said, hey, Randall, we got to add some vanilla in here. It's like you're like predominantly minority, you know? But just for me, just naturally where my, where my eye was going. And she was 100% right, you know? So I would intentionally go out and try to fill gaps for, uh, for Caucasian people. And that, it wasn't like something I was trying to do consciously. But I just know automatically when I had the best equipment, the best facility, you know, the Caucasian demographic is already going to be there. I wanted to get that missing meat on the bone. Fantastic. Audio, um, it, it's your turn. I don't know if I hit my hand or lose or... No, that's excellent. That's excellent. Adi, give us your state of the industry. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that's not being said or won't be said. So to Randall's point, um, you, we know where the state is when we look at the marketing. And I'm very big on the on the marketing side. Now, I'll say this now. I'm in a startup phase. So my career has definitely in fitness has been more on the ground floor, the instructing, the teaching, right? And so I have a different spin on things when it comes to uh, fitness as an industry because my birds I view may not be as high. But once you start going into the business side, and I noticed this, I'm very young in my business. Once you start going to the business side of things, it's amazing how sharp your vision becomes, right? And we all know that, we, and I think I should say this, we all know what we see. And so when you see fitness commercials, right, products, be it, or services, the order usually is white male, white female, depends on what the service or product is that may flip, and then there's a other, black male, black female, Asian person, nondescript Asian person, whomever, but somebody, there's the other category. And that speaks volumes to where, to Randall Point, where we as a fitness industry believe our monies is, right? It speaks volumes to where we believe that our monies are coming from. Now there's some truth to that, but it's not the absolute truth. And also more importantly, I think it speaks truth to where we put our focus and our research and our monies back into those communities. And so when, you're, when we're looking at the fitness industry from the professional side, I definitely think that if we're honest about it, our target demographics across the board has been white, middle to upper class. That's because that's where our commercials are. Our commercials are there. Our marketing, our research is primarily from the bird's eye view, not behind the scenes. So I'm assuming Dr. Cedric can talk more about that. But on the bird's eye, the commercial side of things, that's where we are focusing in on. And so then when we are looking at um, racism, and I don't, and I don't, because I use the term loosely in the sense of, I don't think people are absolutely saying, I don't want black people in my gym, or I don't want, Asian people buying my bikes or I don't want, you know, I don't think people are, I, I just feel like people are not saying that outright, but your comfort level and who you target is apparent to who you believe will buy and purchase your services and your business and your products. And with that, that's where you go out to market to. On the flip side though, when we have it based off of gender, right? We get, we get a little bit more antsy about it. Being if we have a club that is all women in the marketing, how many men would actually go out to the, that club and sign up and become a member of that club? Yeah, we expect for that to happen when it comes to race. Right. We'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll we'll take the initiative. We'll take the we'll take the time to consider when it comes to gender. We'll take the time to consider when it comes to social economics of our target demographics. Who who do we want? Who do we think can afford our services or products? Right. But we won't have that conversation to Randall's point, and I think possibly to the other panel, unless I'm wrong, unless you feel like that we are having it. Because again, I'm coming from a different point of view. I'm coming from more of the point of view from, from looking at it at day to day, as well as when I speak with my 
my coworkers or when I'm looking at the demographics of my club. Now, be it that, I do live in the Seattle area. If you're talking about black people specifically, we're only three to 5% in the general, I'm talking about, you gotta pull a lot of different zip codes to get that three to 5%, <laughs> right, right. The majority of us in that three to 5%, however, we're a transplant, meaning we came here because of work. Mm. Many, most of us in that three to five percent have this have discretion, some kind of discretionary funds, right? And so then you're losing out to Randall's point, you're losing out on the demographics could possibly help, if not better your your product service, your products, because you're again, you're not, you're not, you don't want our money. Not not based on the way that you're you're marketing yourself. Yeah, idea. Yeah. I, I yeah. appreciate yeah. that perspective. That was fantastic. Randall, go ahead. Just saying, green is great. So you want to get that green dollar, no matter what race it is. I think too, because I I say unapologetic. Sydney Wellness is looking to specifically regain that market share or not regain pull in that market share like th that is the purpose of it right most of my girlfriends are black professional women i'm in my i'm entering into my 40s so we're past the entry level portion of things so their managers their directors like this these are my friends and i know they're more like that out there so what do we want to do about it and i would i would say this just chiming in a little bit to, to her point is from my experience, and your panelists, you may agree or not agree, but I think you will, but the black dollar is a very loyal dollar. You know, it is a dollar that once we find our niche, once we find where we're comfortable, like we don't look anywhere else. Because it's like, you know, going through America as a minority, you know, some places you just feel more comfortable than others. So when you do get that person, you do capture it, like it, it sticks. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's a real dollar. All dollars are real, but I mean, I'm sure you guys have your own opinions on that, but to me, that's what I found in my businesses. Thank you, Randall. And Adia, thank you very much. Now, Brian, I'm gonna have you tackle the same question. And I know right. you're a little bit in, in a different vantage point as a consultant and a speaker to the industry, but give us your state of the industry related to unconscious bias and racism. Absolutely. I think even going to the conferences, the URSAs or whatever, and even many of my clients, who have health clubs or even spas for that matter is overwhelmingly Caucasian, or, 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 or overwhelmingly white. And I think the thing that's always hit me or struck me is why is there such a lack of diversity? Not from the client perspective. I know that um, you know, Adia was talking more so from the client perspective, but I'm talking about from the workforce. Like the workforce overwhelmingly is white, right? And 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 it's hard for me to think that it's deliberate exclusion but what i've learned is that if you're not deliberately trying to if you're not intentionally trying to be inclusive then exclusion will happen automatically it'll happen organically mm -hmm. so um i don't think it's like ill will i don't think is um racism per se but idea and both idea and randall brought up the excellent points of that people oftentimes tend to want to hang around with people who they think they have things in common with and the thing that's most physically common is what we look like, the skin color, right? But that's just a little bit <laughs> of what we have. Because you have the skin color, then you have the culture, you see? So I, I think that that's more so what I've seen. And, I've, and, 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 I, and I think living in the United States of America, we have to always remember that it's an amazing country. Because the, the big discussion that we're having right now nationwide could not happen in many other countries without severe blatant persecution mm. in many other countries that i've been to there would be severe government sponsored persecution and that doesn't happen very overtly in america and it's surreal for me to hear these discussions happen this dialogue over the last few months i think i was telling hannah last week it's like i want to pinch myself because the dialogue that's happening right now in the country are things that the black community talks about all the time like all these things, like the white privilege and systemic racism, we talk about it all the time. Um, unfortunately, I know a lot of black people who allow that to hold them back. They allow that dialogue to hold them back. They don't even try 
to go forward or move forward because they may think that, well, I won't get too far anyway. I remember so clearly, um, I was in St. Thomas, this is Ritz Carlton, and um, much like Randall mentioned, not a lot of black people progressing. I mean, even though it's a phenomenal company, at the time, there were not a lot of black people progressing. Nevertheless, we had a, um, a management and training program that got introduced. And in this MIT program, you, if, you, know, you, you applied to go in that program, and then you had 18 months to go in different departments. So you can get a taste. I mean, you all know what I'm talking about. Well, for years, you're hearing all my you know, black colleagues and stuff saying, you see, they're always bringing these white people from the states, from the states, you know, to come. And then they, they never give us black people a chance, a small annual chance. And when I saw the Human Resources Office post that job or that opportunity for the management and training program, of which there were going to be three availabilities, I got so happy. I got so excited because, number one, I was going to apply for it. Because much like Cedric, I'm a lifelong learner. So any opportunity to learn anything, like I'm the front of the line. And I learned that I was the only black person who applied for it. Mm. I think I was like maybe 18 or 19 years old at the time. I was the only black, the other two were, were two white people who came down. They were, they, were, they were like already working on St. Thomas, but they were from other places. And I remember going to the other black folks who you would always hear in the cafeteria and the locker room talking about they don't give us opportunity and they never give us a chance. And I asked them like, why don't you apply? They're like, oh, please, they're never gonna hire us anyway. So they didn't even try, you know? And that more than anything is what let me know that you cannot allow your race to stop you from trying. There's no excuse to not try. So I always want to say, spend God's favors and blessings to Adia and what you're doing with your business and deliberately going out to attract um, African-American black women and so forth. That's so needed. That's so needed. Because like my wife, she's a complete health and wellness junkie. And she preaches this stuff. And there's not enough black people who are taking their health care seriously. They don't see the correlation between their illnesses and what they're eating, their illnesses and their lifestyle. They just accept it. Like they accept the diabetes. They accept the cancer. They accept all of it because that's just in my family lineage. That's just, I'm supposed to get it. No, you don't. Mm. And you go around, so like we, like, like we live in the DC metro area and pretty much any major city, you drive around and you know when you're in the black neighborhood. You know why? Because every other, every block, you got the fast food. Every block, you got the liquor stores. Every block. So, that, so that's the kind of thing that affects our health and wellness, fitness, all that in a, in a major way. Mm -hmm. Brian, thank you so much. Um, Cedric, state of the industry. Sure. Um, I think as been, has been stated by uh, all of the panelists uh, to this point is that um, I think in, in terms of the members and the clients, um, the industry has has and still predominantly caters to a largely white audience. Um, but as, as the others have stated, I, I don't think it's, it's, um, it's uh, some sinister plot, um, but I, I think it is just, it, it's, um, and I think that's why, you know, the, the term unconscious bias is, is so in vogue because it really is a, a general lack of awareness because when we surround ourselves with others who are like us, why would we expect to make different decisions? How, how do you expect to learn and grow if you're always surrounding yourself with those who are similar to you? And I think one of the things that, that happens oftentimes is that we try to approach problem solving by dealing with symptoms as opposed to the actual heart of the problem. And so, uh, you know, diversity, training, and, and that type of thing while it may have some value, I would argue that it has, it has limited value. I think it does more to soothe one's conscience than it does to actually affect real change. And I think it, it, it might seem subtle, but there's a, there's a distinction between diversity and inclusion. And I think inclusion is what really starts to bring about some change. When you start inviting people different from you into your world at the table, at this table, so they have an opportunity to be at the advisory, on the advisory boards, on 
the actual board of directors and being able to have a voice so that things that you aren't aware of as a person who's not a person of color, they can be brought to your level of awareness. Because it, it's, it's only until we can begin to understand an issue and get a glimpse of that issue do we have a snowball's chance of changing it. And I think, um, so, but I think there've been a lot of, there, there's a lot of action on the treadmill where you're, you're doing a lot of activity, but you're not gaining any ground. And I think, you know, th that's what I see a lot over the course of my career when it comes to these types of discussions around what can we do to, Im to improve race, to improve the, 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 the profile and diversity of our, of our demographic. I mean, heck, if you think about the fitness industry, the fitness industry, there are a lot of people that, that they quote unquote uh, don't include or don't think about including. If you think about individuals who are impacted by overweight and obesity, do you think the fitness industry is very welcoming, welcoming to those types of individuals? Heck no. If, if, if you do a Google search of fitness and you click the image bar, look, look, look at the images that come up. They're, norm, they're typically white men and women who look like they've been blessed with some great genetics that are probably 80%, and I'm probably being ultra conservative of the images you see. You'll, you'll see a, a smattering and a sprinkling of some people of color, some people who might be impacted by overweight or obesity. You might see some people who um, may have some type of physical limitation, but by and large, it's, it's the beautiful bodies. Because that, that, is, that is the, I think the myth that many have bought into is, is what sells in the fitness environment. And why I find it so ironic is that I'd say 90%, and this is probably conservative of the fitness professionals that I talk to, they're individuals who love and are passionate about helping others. And if you can take that passion that they have for really wanting to help others, and translate it into broadening their definition of who those others really are and what, and, and what they really look like, then I think we can start to have some progress. Yeah, fantastic, Cedric, well stated, thank you. Cedric, I'm gonna pose the next question to you to start off with. Adia, do you wanna, do you wanna chime in? I do, if, if, it's, if that's Please. okay. Um, because um, being that I am a, a nerd, and my background is about numbers, I tried to Google numbers on race in the fitness industry and i understand that the fitness industry as a whole is still a very young industry right it, to the what we know it as today but i'm just curious especially uh, uh, dr cedric and um luke randall brian i couldn't find real numbers as far as anything outside of the typical demographics age race, age and gender are the typical numbers that you usually find social economic standards but it's always really curious is why don't we on the as a whole have really access information to demographics about race within the fitness industry and then demographics when it comes to social economics like true social economics um, data points that we can utilize because I couldn't find it. Now I may they've been looking the wrong way, the wrong direction, but Google didn't pop that up. Cedric, you may want to weigh in on that. Sure. Um, Adia, in terms of um, the participants and, and kind of physical activity behaviors, there there are pretty good data that makes distinctions between blacks, Hispanics, whites, and, and so forth. But in terms of, um, from an employment perspective, from a, from, mm -hmm. you know, holding leadership and so forth, I would agree with you that that, that, is, a, that is a tremendous uh, void within the industry in terms of kind of understanding what percentage of personal trainers are people of color, as an example. Good data on, on those don't exist, but the, the other challenge is that good data just on the, on the overall population of personal trainers, group fitness instructors really is, is, is lacking in our, in our industry. 
There's a, there's a group called the Coalition for the Registration of Exercise Professionals. They're trying to acquire some of those numbers, but, but that group is at its infancy, really. Okay. okay. Thank so, you. Cedric, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this question to you first. Sure. A, a long-winded question. Uh, most white people that I know would say, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. We then tell a story about how we are friends with black people and explain that we're, in fact, a good human. Systemic racism is so ingrained into virtually every facet of our society that we've become blind to it. Uh, it reminds me of the quote, who discovered water? And the answer is, I don't know, but I'm certain it wasn't a fish. So how do we deal with a problem that we aren't effectively acknowledging? Well, I think one of the things, Luke, um, I think when, you, when people hear the term racist and, and we, we tend to think of it in the context of a white person hearing it, but I think when any individual hears racist, they don't feel warm and fuzzy if, if you refer to them as being a racist. And I think part of it is because we, we've so polarized things to extremes and it's either or. People think that if, that if you say that I am racist, that you're basically saying I'm evil because it's kind of an all or none thing. And there are people who I think have these blind spots that may have some uh may have you know tendencies and behaviors that can you know equate to what we would define as 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 racist like um i think idea was was was, was uh it was you know spot on when she talked about how people would compliment her on on her 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 speech and and her her level of intellect and and almost do it in you know it's, it's like you're a credit to your race uh compliment all those kind of backhanded compliments, which really are subtle forms of racism. And so when people hear race, they need to understand that I'm not attacking them as a person. I'm not saying that you're an evil, despicable person, but I'm saying there are opportunities for you to grow, which is true for all of us. And so, so I think th that's one of the things that makes it very difficult. It's very difficult to have those open and honest conversations because people become pretty defenseless, uh, defensive when they hear racist, when they hear white privilege, because the, the, the typical person when they hear white privilege say, hey, I busted my tail to get what I have. It wasn't because I, you know, I had, you know, I was special, but what they don't realize is what, when, when you say about white privilege, you're saying that you didn't, ha you, there are certain conversations that you don't have to have as a white parent with your children, that as a parent, of like I have four young men who are men of color and I have I've had that conversation with each of them and when I looked at the um uh what's his name Amon Aubrey's uh event that rocked me because I have four boys and that could have been any one of them because they like because of because of dad's influence they like to be active they like to run but you know what? Just this is an example of I, I think kind of the the kind of what you don't know you don't know. When my boys are out running, I tell them wear bright, colorful clothing because you're less likely to get mistaken as someone who's out trying to do something that's problematic wearing bright, colorful clothing. I tell them to be aware of where they're going to run. If they're going to be running in a neighborhood like what Randall did, have a buddy with you who might not have as quite a good a tan as you. <laughs> you know, and those are things that, you know, you, you don't have to have that conversation with your sons. And, and, and so I think until people can approach this with humility and understanding that rather than seeking to try to defend a position, make a point, take a time out, listen, and try to seek to understand what the other person is trying to communicate. And I think we need to extend people grace too, because like you open by saying, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And, and that's where I think it's incumbent upon us to extend an individual like yourself grace 
so that you don't walk on pens and needles about saying exactly the right perfect thing all the time. Because last time I checked, we as humans never say the right perfect thing all the time, regardless of our color. And so I think if we could approach this with more humility and, and grace and mutual understanding, then we can start to have those important fierce conversations that can start to get us to challenge these long held notions that we have. Cedric, thank you very much for that. Ryan, same question to you. How do we deal with a problem that we aren't effectively acknowledging? I mean, just to echo a part of what Cedric um, said is first and foremost, rec rec recognize the privilege, recognize white privilege, because that is a real thing. And I'll have to be completely honest with you. I didn't fully grasp that concept until a few years ago. Because I have two children, like my, my wife and I have two children, we have a daughter and a son, and our, and our son is six years old. And there's the conversations that I'm gonna need to have with him that somebody who's white may not need to, need to have with their sons. And that's just a fact. There's conversations I'm gonna have to have with, that we already have with both of our children regarding the curriculum in school. Like the only thing about, like, the, the only thing that you're learning about black people cannot be about, well, first we had slavery and then Dr. King Jr. and then President Obama. No, there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of things. So that's a big reason as to why we even homeschool, so we can impart a lot of those kinds of things in our children very early on. So I would say number one, recognize your privilege, um, understand how, how things like, <clears throat> gosh, even angel food cake is white, Snow White is white, Santa Claus is white, you're playing the game of pool, it ends with the white ball knocking the black ball in the, in the corner pocket. I mean, all those things, make, and everything bad is black, right? You have the, the, the ugly duckling is black. Um, the black cat is bad luck. If, um, if I want to do harm to you, I'll blackmail you. So all those kinds of things. So just rec understanding that, recognizing that, educating yourself on that, I think that's one. Two, I would say check in and speak up. Just check in. If, you, if, you, if, if you're white and you have black friends, black colleagues, black acquaintances, check in. Check in and speak up whenever you hear any kind of off color joke, any kind of injustice going on, speak up. Don't just be silent because silence in my mind is complicit. It means that you're going along with it. Like stand up, right? Stand up and speak up and say, no, that's wrong. That's wrong, period. And I would say lastly, hire, promote, and support black professionals. Mm. Amen. Hire, hire, support, and promote black professionals. You know, I, I mean, I have been privileged. I mean, the vast majority, of all the hundreds of clients that we've had over the years, the vast majority have been white. People who hired me. You, you Luke, discover strength, white, right? But I'm saying we need to have more of that, right? I know that I'm not necessarily the norm. You see what I'm saying? Like we need to have many other black people who do a good job, uh, intentionally sought out to bring their unique perspectives to the equation. So those are my thoughts on that area. Ryan, thank you so much. Idea, same question to you. Uh, dealing with a problem that we aren't effectively acknowledging, how do we do it? You can't acknowledge a problem that you don't recognize that you have, right? And so if everybody at the table is eating Cheerios, they don't say to themselves, most likely they will say, oh, I wish I had something different. Right, it, 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 they, they just won't because that's what they're used to, to everybody's point, that's where they're used to. Um, and so I, it's hard, the hard part is trying to help, I, let me step back. I just had this conversation with my, the president of my club last week. Um, he wanted to talk about essentially his response, the club's response to the Black Lives Matter, um, and where, if there needed to be more, what more would look like, essentially. Um, and my challenge to him was, where are, you, where are you pulling your diversity from? Where are you pulling your candidates from? Where are you, where are you when you walk down the hallway, because when we walk down the hallway, you get to see all the people who work in the club in that location, right? So when you walk down the hallway, what do you notice? Because I, I naturally see there's 10 black people who are 
trainers, instructors. I'm the only female black instructor that you have. I see that there's only three Asian. Like I naturally see that because I see it as a whole. But when you come down, do you, what do you see? Because you have to recognize what's in front of you. And I think I think that's really what we're trying to say is you have to you have to say to yourself, I'm ready to open my eyes because I can't make you see what's already in front of you. And then once you do that, the real question then becomes where, one, do I want to diversify? Do I want other people of color? Because we're assuming that you do. Now everybody's going to say yes to that. And that's your choice to make. And we all have a choice in this. But then if that's the case, be honest about what you're trying to do, right? Be honest and say out loud, I, if I do want to make my, my business more inclusive, more diverse, then I know that I have more of a, a of a non diverse grouping. Then what am I doing to make that different? Where am I pulling my candidates from? Do I need to change that? Who do I need to speak to? If I can't, if I don't have it, then who do I know? Can I start asking people for this? Because as a black person, I can only speak as a black person in the United States. I have to go outside of my community and my comfort zone in order to diversify my network right I, I do that I, I make a point to do that not because I have to but because I want to I have to get outside you too non-minority will have to do that if that's what you want you're gonna have to get out of your comfort zone you're gonna have to talk to other people you're gonna have to pull in somebody and if you say well if I do it for black people then the Asian people will be next. Yes, they too should be next because they have a voice and they have just as much intellect. They have just as much skill share. Yes, these are conversations that's going to have to be had with other minority groups. So yes, it's going to come around. But if you want it, you're going to have to open your eyes to it. You're going to have to be honest to it. And then you're going to have to do some extra work. Idea. I, yeah, you, and, and when you do that extra work, nobody wants to hear how hard it is. You, you don't tell the minority, anybody on the minority side that it's hard. Nobody's going to feel sympathy for you. <laughs> now we're in the majority. That's just how it works. People in power don't get the chance to say it's hard being in power to somebody who's at the bottom. Not to say we're at the bottom, but we're at the top. So when you get to that point where you say, I'm ready to do something, it's your action plan to do it. Stop asking other people all the time, what should I be doing? Start doing some homework on your side of things too. And when you decide to do that, and it's okay, because I mess up all the time. When it's okay, you mess up, just own it. Just own it and then keep moving forward. But it's going to be hard. Yes, welcome. It's going to be hard. I just want to say, preach. Okay, dear? <laughs> preach. Preach. We're now, Brian, look, Brian, I'm trying to get into public speaking. Now I'm gonna call you. So I want you to be the like our friend when I do that now, right? I'm still networking. <laughs> <laughs> but you just said everything, okay? I'm, so I'm gonna shut up. Well, Adia, that was fantastic. Uh, Randall, same question. We'll kind of wrap up this question with you. Again, dealing with a problem that we haven't effectively acknowledged. And historically, the response has been like my response is, I'm not racist, I'm friends with black people, and then I think the problem doesn't exist. So how do we address it? Yeah, I think uh, everything that's happening in terms of creating awareness is, is great right now. And I've, I've been shocked. I've had a lot of white friends that have been blowing up my phone and texting me like, hey buddy, how you doing? Checking in, you know. Um, and, and for me, it's great that social media has kind of have, has put light on it, something that's been an issue for years. Like me growing up in the hood, like cops killed us all the time. Like that, like George Floyd happened all the time. I mean, I can think of probably 10 times I saw that happen uh, growing up. Um, and, and we rapped about it. It was in our music. You know, we, we, we felt like that was our only vehicle we had to share it with the world. Now the world is being more, uh, more aware of it. And some of my friends that are 100% not racist, but they're just trying to get their head around like, what is this Black Lives Matter movement? Why are you saying Black Lives? Why aren't you saying like all lives matter? You know, um, and the reason, and I don't think it's coming from a racist standpoint for the Black Lives Matter, but white lives have always mattered in this country. Black lives haven't. So that's where the, 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 the standpoint is kind of coming from saying, hey, hey, we're, we're here too. Um, it's not necessarily from a racist deal, but it's just trying to create acknowledgement and awareness of it. And I think it's great. I think it's a great opportunity for us as a fitness community 
to what Adia said, get out of our comfort zone. And what happens, we preach this in the fitness industry all day, when you get out of your comfort zone, what happens? You grow, right? And so for us, all of us have gotten into this industry. All of us have been part of this industry because we truly want to help people. Obviously, it's a business. We have to make money for the business to grow and to be able to pay bills. But ultimately, we have a heart for helping people. So we all want to help more people. So being able to, to give chances to minorities, giving chances to african Americans, to Asians, and this is something that I'm sure the panelists will agree with me on just being raised as, as black is my dad always preached to me, you have to be spot on. You can't mess it up because you don't want to mess it up for the next guy coming behind you. You don't want to make it harder for him coming behind you. And when I would say to the people in the industry, let's just say, oh, you know what? I hired a black guy in the past and maybe the guy stole for you. Or maybe you showed up later. Maybe it was a bad experience don't just write that off. There's a, there's the, the majority of, of us are not that way. The majority of our minorities that are, I mean, look at where all of us have gotten to in our lives today. We wanted a shot. And once we got that shot, we were willing to do any, every, anything and everything in our power. And uh, Cedric kind of hit on this earlier about being inclusive in people. The more people you have from different perspectives, the bigger your melting pot is, the more creativity you're going to have in your business, the more creativity we're going to have in our industry. And we all, we're all searching for the same goal. We all want to help people and get optimal health. But in searching for that creativity, the more minds we have from different backgrounds, from different, different life, life perspectives, the better, the, the better we're all going to be able to get at reaching our ultimate goal, which is truly helping people. Randall, thank you so much. Now, now, listening to the four of you talk, um, you, the four of you embody the antithesis of a victim mentality. So I want to make a, a comment, and I don't want you to agree with me, um, but I want your reflection on this. So I have found myself saying, okay, there's the Viktor Frankl, stimulus and response. Stimulus is what happens to me, and response is what I choose to do next. And it's up to me to decide what I'm gonna do next. And the four of you in so many words have talked about how, yes, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control what you do next. And I think that's the most powerful way to show up in our personal and professional lives. And, but I've almost used that as an excuse to ignore systemic racism. So is it okay for me to say, hey, you should not be a victim? You can't control what happens to you. You can only control about uh, what you're gonna do next. And that is true. But at the same time, we still have institutionalized racism and that's a big problem. Can both of those things be true? Because so many of you just told stories about your parents basically put you in a position where you are not going to be a victim. I mean, that's what I heard is you were taught that you can't control what's coming at you, but you get to decide what you're gonna do next. Can both of those ideas be true? Don't be a victim, but my goodness, we have to confront and combat systemic racism. And I'll just open that up for you to completely disagree with or say, uh, maybe I'm on the right track. Yeah, I would just say, as an industry as a whole, if I'm driving a, a Ferrari and a Ferrari's got a lot of horsepower, and as like for saying that, we, let's just leave racism existing, a Ferrari would drive very fast in second gear. Doesn't mean that it's, it's going to, you know, that it's, it can't perform better, right? So yes, all of us have, have had to overcome, but I don't want my children to have yeah. to go through what I went through, and I don't want their children to have to go through what 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 they're going to have to being 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 of color and some of the things. So in order for us to grow as a community, and I think as 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 fitness people in the fitness industry, we have direct relationship. We, people come to us to, for coaching. Yeah. We have direct impact on people's lives, on people's development, on people's side. We, I mean, we literally save people what we do in our industry. And so for, if, you're, if you're looking at it for, you know what, just go ahead and just overcome these obstacles that we're just going to leave in place, what are you doing to help the industry? What are you doing to help other people? What are you doing as a human being to try to make this world a better place? So, yes – we knew that the challenges were going to be in front of us and we're going to, and we are where we are. We're, we're all sitting here today because of our ability to overcome. 
But in terms of everyone that's listening on this conference, if you're listening on this conference right now, I believe you're a good human being because you at least care, right? You're at least interested on some level or some degree. And challenge yourself and ask yourself, how can I grow to make, to make globally make this world easier for everyone? Thank you, Randy. Cedric, did you have a comment? There's not, there's not much to add to that. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Luke, I, I'm sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. So, I think though, when we ask questions like that, I think the answer is yes, you can have two separate, um, separate train of thoughts because we're capable of making two separate train of, uh, train of thoughts and they, they can they run in parallel, but they don't have to intersect. But the question though is putting the ownership on the minority and not the majority, right? Because just in that case where you ask the question, can you be a overcomer of a system that we know is bad and it is no it is structured to help put you down and keep you down right like redlining wasn't a made-up thing right that that wasn't made up and if you don't know what redlining means when it comes to real estate that's part of our history is black wall street i didn't even know i didn't know people didn't know about black wall street Right. I didn't know. I didn't know because we we all knew because we all knew that we being black people in the South knew there was a lot of successful black communities that had been burnt down, that had been taken down. So that was put on the ownership on those who were attacked and those who are who are negative impact by systems. And the question I have then would be the rebuttal of can you still be a good person? knowing that systematic racism does exist and not do something to prevent it and make it better can you still can you still consider yourself a good person knowing that black people make 13 to 14 percent of the united states population yet we're over 70 percent of the penal system and you not feel that's wrong because the numbers the numbers Dr. Sandra said it. The numbers, though, how we got the numbers may, may not be accurate, but the numbers are still numbers. Can you still be a good person knowing that Randall, in all appearances, should have been pulled over by the fashion police at the instant when he was on his, on his bike <laughs> with that orange flag wave flag, and the, the kids wagon? I know, Randall, I have a kid. I have a five year old, right? I, I, I see you in your jersey. It, really, the question is, why didn't his wife pull him over <laughs> versus that cop? And then the question would have been, what did his friends say then? And then what did his friend do? And it sounded like he did the right thing, right? He stood up for you. But the question would be then those in majority, would you have stood up for Randall? Do you stand up for Randall? Do you stand up for Brian? Do you set up Cedric? Because you know that there needs to be diversity because you make diversity happen in your stock portfolio. You make diversity happen in your 401k. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. add this. I don't want to take a uh, hug the mic too much, but just kind of, you kind of inspire me what you're saying there. But if someone's looking, if someone's watching this and they're saying, well, how do I get involved? How do I help? But just start with something that you're already good at. Yeah. Uh, to, to, give it, to give an example, one of, my, one of my best friends is one of the most brilliant people I know. Uh, very smart, very good, very articulate. And he started something called the Florida Debate Initiative to help minorities be able to articulate and articulate thought, which as you guys, I'm sure would all agree, being able to articulate is one of the most uh, powerful weapons we can have as a minority, being able to express, even in business or minority, non-minority, it's one of the most valuable tools, but as minorities, we're not exposed to that growing up. And that's one of the, that's the charity that I'm, you know, that I'm uh, promoting on this one, but you know, for me, he inspired me where he, he, for him, it's like, I don't know how, you know, I'm overwhelmed what to do, but I'm really good at this. I can help this way. Pick at what you're already good at and start there. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, just um, real quick, Luke, the whole concept of, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and you can be an overcomer, that transcends race, right? As, as you know, most of what I do is I tell people that, right? No matter what they are, who they are from, like where they're from, I've dealt with CEO, executives, Fortune 100 companies, to you know, school janitors, and it's the same type of message. Overcome, set your goals, accomplish, et cetera, et cetera. So that transcends race. But what I will say, if you are in the majority, as how Adia mentioned, and you're telling someone in the minority that just overcome, grow, 
then you also have to be willing to state what you specifically are doing to help, to help combat the systemic racism that's been in place pretty much since the entire country has been founded. From the very beginning, the whole thing about all people are created equal was never true because at that point they were, they were slaves. So black people were never viewed as equal and they still are not viewed as equal in many ways. So that's what I'll say about that. Okay, so, so our kind of our final question uh, to wrap up over the next 20 minutes. And, and as we get into this question, I just wanna remind everyone that's on this webinar right now, that's on this call, if you wanna donate still to the four wonderful charities that our panelists uh, want proceeds to go to, um, and we really have some just absolutely phenomenal charities, and Randall just mentioned one of them, that link to donate is in the chat and you can access it there. And I also wanna mention, we have a ton of just phenomenal questions coming in and we can't get to all of them. I'm gonna incorporate one of those questions into kind of my closing question here. And that question is, what do we need to do to make it better? So I would love abstract ideas, mindset, attitude changes, but I would also love to hear some specific action steps. And I got a question from uh, our listenership saying, what about things like scholarships for minorities? Um, is that something that we see that we need in this industry? And, and before I turn it over to the four of you to wrap up over the next 20 minutes, part of the impetus for this whole conversation came from Hannah and I having a discussion, going to I think 14 or 15 consecutive URSA conferences and saying, my goodness, when we walk around in our own industry, it is so incredibly white at an international conference. And then Hannah and I, who have put on a conference of our own for 10 years saying, how many black people did we have come and be a keynote speaker at our own conference? So that's what we've witnessed. What do we do um, from a more abstract mindset idea standpoint to a, hey, what's our next action step standpoint? And we don't need to go in a specific order here. I would love to hear whoever wants to weigh in first can take the floor here. You know what, I'll just, um, I'll, I'll be very short because I have two main points for that question. I will say, um, number one, have an honest conversation with yourself and with your team as to why don't we have more racial diversity and refuse to accept some superficial answer. You know, I just haven't looked hard enough. Like really get into the guts of it. Why have we not had more racial diversity? Why haven't we had black keynote speakers? Why haven't we, why don't we have more black people on our teams? Why don't we have more people on our executive boards? Like ask that question and, and, and number two, why do I want to have more diversity? Adia mentioned it, like, you may not want to have more racial diversity. So if you say that you want to have more racial diversity, ask yourself, why? And it can't be because it's in vogue. It seems like it's a nice thing to do, and Black Lives Matter is everywhere. No, 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 we don't want that. I don't want to be a charity case. Never. Never. Don't be, I, don't, I don't want to be anybody's charity case. So if you want more racial diversity, have the honest conversation with yourself and with your team as to why do we want it? Beyond revenue. <laughs> because as Randall said, by people we spend, right? Mm -hmm. We always have. But beyond that, beyond revenue and beyond in vogue, why do you see the human dignity aspect of it all? That we're people, that we're humans, and we have far more in common then we have differences. So that's pretty much what I have for that. I think that's really boils down to those two things. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in next. One of the things that you have to understand if you want to make a change is like any businessman going into a market, you have to understand your demographic. You have to understand our culture. You have to understand, you know, where we've been in life and generally our culture I bet that if you looked at uh, minorities, blacks in particular, if you looked at population of who's exercising when they're five to 18, you probably see more black people exercising because we're playing sports. It's in our culture to play sports. And then as we get older, it kind of not part of our culture to keep exercising, to keep up with that. On the same, the same one, the, the, the converse of that is, you know, I've had a lot of white training clients where they have come in and they've, they've been training with me and they're 40 or they're, you know, 45 or 50. And Hey, I've never lifted weights before. I didn't play any sports. I'm like, where have you been? You know, catering to that demographic. But if you look at, you know, the numbers of health clubs in the health industry, we're really catering to demographic between 35 and 65 and 70. 
So we're missing a big meat of the diverse market there. We're missing a lot of, of people getting them to give in. How we get them in is through awareness. How we get them through is a idea was saying with, with marketing if, and, and having, having, having their face, having our faces and minority faces on your publications. That's going to bring people in to take a look at it just organically, you know, but kind of the, the, the big thing was that and you got to ask yourself, do you really want change? And if you do want change, you, you probably need to have a person of color to help walk you through that. You know, because you're, you're talking to understanding, you know, and I, I would do that in, in, in my business. You know, like, for instance, when I started my business, I hired Brent Darden to kind of help. He'd been there before, knew the game, phenomenal job. A big part of my success is because of him. Hire someone that has experience, you know, and, and another way you can get to our community is, is through our churches, through our community centers. You know, if you sponsor a, a, cook, a church cookout, the church is going to love you. No church that I know, no black church I know is going to turn down free food. But it's a good way to get your brand out there. You're not selling us something. It's, you know, getting the getting African American a dollar. We don't want to feel like you're selling us, like, because you're trying to get over on us. We want to feel like you care about us. We want to feel like you truly want to meet our needs. And when you do, it's a level for us to break over. Like I was saying, over, once you get that trust and we open up, like, we're all in. And we don't look elsewhere. You, you have us for life. And we're going to bring our friends. We're going to bring our community. It's, it's an organic thing that happens. But that would be one of my things. I just kind of came to the top of the head when I was saying it. But if I was going into a business trying to get a new demographic, I'd hire an expert or someone that has experience in that. I would look at doing that. Randall, thank you. Adia or Cedric? I, I was going to let Adia go first. And I know you're a gentleman, so I know I, I know better not to not to turn that just turn that down. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, I would ask the question um, first and foremost: What's the purpose of your scholarship? Really, is it to is it to ease some guilt that we discussed in the past, or is it to is it really to try to help somebody get through? Because then you wouldn't say a scholarship, you would say an internship, or you would say an employment program. And I think that's where, to Randall's point, and Brian also said this, we're not token, we're not charity cases. There's no way in the world that you can have a, a group of people from a, a diaspora, a continent, from different cultures, different, and work them as free labor for, for over hundreds of years and they say we're lazy. Does, does that make sense? So then when you put it into real term in real life terminology, don't feel pity for us. Give us fairness. And if you want fairness, then you have to start making the playing field even. And so if you have, but what we're saying to you is, it's now time for you to open up your funnel. Right, we're not asking for charity to Brian's point. We're not asking you to give us something to Randall point. We're asking you to open up your funnel. That is the most important thing you can do because when you open up your funnel, you get in the best of the best. And if you find somebody who does not meet your expectation, that's not a reflection of the community of a race. That's a reflection of the person. You still continue to open up your funnel. But you're, right now, we can say in the fitness industry, Unequivocally, the photo is very narrow. And I'll pass it on to Dr. Cedric. Thank you. I, I guess um, I, I would start first by um, encouraging the listeners as um, that are that are on this to to focus on what they what they already know um, just from what they do in practice. And, and when we think about, um, we're in this built business to try to promote fitness and wellness. And if you think about racism, it is impossible for a person to be truly fit and well if they're forced to deal with the institutional and systemic racism that exists. While people have done magnificently and i think my panelists are great examples of 
of overcoming those odds, I would venture a guess that it was not without some cost. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it may even be a, a slightly hidden cost, but you can't be fit and well if you're dealing with racism and these things aren't being addressed. And I think one of the things that people have to become more comfortable with is confrontation. I, early on, Brian said um, that silence is equivalent to complicity, and I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the reasons why people are silent, therefore complicit, is because human nature, we tend to avoid confrontation like the plague. And I would encourage people to shift that notion from confrontation to having a, what I call a carefrontation. You care so much about people, about the issues, about advancement, that you have to confront the issues. You can't sit by silently when a guy like Randall is, is doing what we would all encourage him to do. Get on his bike. I probably wouldn't encourage him to wear the, the little yellow outfit, but I would encourage him to get on his bike <laughs> with his little one and get out there and be active. What his friend did is what every single one of us should do, mm. is confront that issue. It's easy to, to sit back in silence. And I think until we become comfortable getting outside of our comfort zones and caring enough to confront, I think progress is gonna be limited. But I tend to be what I call a realistic optimist. What I observe that's occurring in the discussions that we're able to have and the engagement that I'm seeing, I'm optimistic that people are starting to care enough to confront. People are starting to care enough to get out of their comfort zones. And I think that organizations are starting to do more than just come up with pithy phrases and, and nice social media posts. But I think to your point, Luke, is to take some tangible action. And when I think like the impact that it's had on our organization is to really be even more invested and engaged than we have been in supporting those grassroots community efforts that can truly help to better level the playing field when it comes to health equity issues. You know, supporting programs like, like Girl Trek, Black, Black, Black Girls in a Run, different by empowering those individuals and training them to be able to deliver good quality, accessible, and affordable exercise experiences in their neighborhoods. There, there's a wonderful program we support that's called BOX, Building on Kids Success, where in underrepresented in underserved schools, they go in and they provide physical activity experiences for little elementary school kids. And they give them little homework assignments to go home and do little nutrition exercises with their parents so that we can start to affect entire families. And I think until we start to really get engaged and realize that while what we do in the gym is magnificent, if we can't impact the communities where those gyms are based, we're missing an opportunity. Because many of the people that we want to reach, yes, Randall's right, there's, a, there's always a business opportunity there, but I think there's a greater opportunity to impact lives is if we look at ourselves as being a hub and an influencer within the communities that, in which we're located. And so that, so, that would be my, my friendly challenge to, to all the, I think, you know, well-intentioned, engaged, motivated, wonderful people that I've had the opportunity to, to meet and work with over my 30 plus year career in this, in this field. Excellent, Cedric. Thank you so much. Randall, Adia, Brian, on behalf of our entire audience, and we have people from um, all over the world tuning in right now in every conceivable time zone, thank you for your candor. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for being great teachers and great leaders to us on this call and to our industry. Everyone have a fantastic day. And, and again, thank you so much to our panelists. And thank you again, Luke. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you.
Thanks. Thanks for having us, Luke. Thanks, guys. <laughs>